what is RICHER? Uh, so RICHER is our acronym for uh, Responsive Intersectoral Interdisciplinary Community and Child Health Education and Research. So it really came out of what was it that we were trying to accomplish in a, a particular neighborhood in Vancouver. Um, and the ideas are very much informed by conversations at the outset with both the community but also with uh, Gilles and the um, Fondation uh, team here to try and see what is it that we might do to address some fairly significant health and child developmental issues. So um, the background of the initiative is aligned also with the background for the program of research that we've developed. But basically, one of the, we, you all see images, contrasting images, I think, of BC and Vancouver in particular. So on the one hand, we have the highest real estate rates. We have a beautiful social environment with mountains and water and all kinds of amenities. And on the other side, we have the highest child poverty rate in Canada. And this inner city neighborhood in which we're working um, was, is recognized as one of the most impoverished neighborhoods in the country. Um, some of you will probably in um, regular news things hear about the downtown east side. This is the neighborhood adjacent to what is called the downtown east side. And one of the first things we heard at the beginning of our work in this neighborhood was the resistance to being characterized as that population because of the very prominent um, public images of people who um, people were trying to say, but you have to see us differently. We we aren't we aren't that. We're not we're not to be reduced to those very um, negative images. So what we were there were through our analysis of the neighborhood and of the health challenges, what we were trying to do with the program was to provide timely access to early intervention and prevention services for underserved families, work collaboratively. So we positioned our initiative as something that was complementary to existing services because we had to work with those people, but also we wanted to show that there was something unique about what needed to be done to respond to the needs of this population. So we wanted to work collaboratively in partnership to improve health outcomes, school completion, and build social capital through um, using an equity and social determinants of health lens. And um, importantly, we wanted to also work to develop transition services for vulnerable children and youth because many of the children were also children who were in the care of the Ministry of Children and Family Development, which is our um, social services sector. So it's this part about collaboration that I'm going to focus in particular on. So how, show how we've organized the services in order to achieve these aims. So in our research, we, we've now undertaken, I think, seven studies, some of them with partners in Ontario here. Um, but what we've tried to do is look at what were the conditions that contribute to inequities in access to care, but also in child health outcomes. Understand both the processes and practices. So what is it that we do as clinicians, one-on-one, -on -one, in the way we dialogue with our com community counterparts and the way we provide our care that dismantle both social barriers, so why does someone not want to go see a clinician or why does someone not access care, and also structural barriers. There was no care. I couldn't get at it, um, I, didn't, I couldn't afford to get there, I didn't have the time, et cetera. So it was, it was both these aspects of asset, access that we wanted to understand. We also wanted to show that, be able to demonstrate that what we were providing as an alternative to the typical models of primary health care achieved similar outcomes, to, um, met, met standards of quality, and, out, and achieved outcomes, and what were the characteristics of the practice that produced those outcomes. So again, what was it that people did that changed the outcomes for these families? And then fi a, a final project, which we're still working on, is to try and understand the ways structural violence, and by this we mean policies, procedures, rules, etc., create obstacles that people, that 
that cr contribute to inequities. We wanted to show how that operates to affect care. And some of this relates to the conversations yesterday about how we have legislation that says you can do this, but we have practices that mean people never take up those opportunities. So, so here we are, um, we have a population, a neighborhood that has about 8.5% of Vancouver's children. Our population and the studies that we've done with them include indigenous children, about 30% of the neighborhood are what we call urban Aboriginal population, so people have left their um, uh, historical reserves or um, traditional territories and moved to the urban center and then are mixed in. We have a third new immigrant and we have other poor families. Um, so we have pediatric, so this, this is an outreach program of the pediatric center. So the pediatric center is seven kilometers away typically not used by these families because they needed primary care first to access it, to get a referral, et cetera. So we, um, even though we had, what we saw was a neighborhood that despite commitments to universal access, there was limited primary health care. And now what we have is not only primary health care, but we have primary health care distributed in neighborhood spaces, spaces that the community identified as safe and as ones they felt comfortable accessing. Um, in our processes, community input is prioritized and all of our research has been vetted and partnered with um, community organizations, including the neighborhood indigenous organizations. So we've all talked briefly about social determinants of health and health equity. And I just wanna point out from this slide um, that's looking at when we talk about the allocation of resources and the need for data to, to, to justify the allocation of resources, everybody in Canada values healthcare and we say we should spend money on healthcare. But when we actually look at what it is that determines health, the healthcare is only 25%. What we typically understand as healthcare is only 25% of what produces the health outcome. And I think that's been illustrated in the other conversations. So part of what we're trying to do is say, use these data to say, as we practice as healthcare providers or as members of healthcare teams, our practices need to reflect and attend to these other influences. So it's not just about the clinical piece, it's the clinical piece in conjunction with concerns about housing, concerns about um, educational support concerns about. So it's that this is a way we can use those data. So um, I, won't go, I won't go into all of these points, but um, the earlier presenters talked about using the EDI as a, as a measure of population, um, as a measure of the well-being of children at school entry in terms of their developmental readiness. We used that data to justify working in this neighborhood. This neighborhood had the highest developmental vulnerability in the province at 87% for on two or, two or more measures of subscales of the tool. And we have now, 10 years later, using those same analyses, which we didn't undertake, but that the research team at UBC did, um, we've now reduced developmental vulnerability in this neighborhood by 20% at a time when the province's developmental vulnerability has trended upwards. So the trend was upwards everywhere but this neighborhood. So we think we had something to do with that through the intersectoral engagement. Um, and we've also measured the quality of care. But again, I wanna talk about the organizational structures, et cetera. So this is our neighborhood where the green arrow is. So the darker the color, the greater the vulnerabilities. That was when we started, and now this is where we're at. So one of the things that I want to point out is that how care is provided, we've shown it's instrumental in achieving the outcomes. So the processes of care. So we as individuals in however and wherever we interact espouse the culture of the, and the underlying values. So here we showed that the clinician's interpersonal style is very strongly associated with the outcome of patient empowerment. So it was things like 
clearly explaining, engaging with, involving in decisions, being respectful, and the empowerment outcome is, um, for us, it was that we were trying, because we were dealing with children and families with so many different kinds of diagnoses, we needed something that ref reflected the parents' sense that they understood their child's care and could manage their child's care, et cetera. So it was this sense, I now know who to go to, how, when um, I, I need to involve others, et cetera. And we accomplished this all through uh, different kinds of partnerships. The particular one, so this is our overall logic model, which is very busy. But in the top right, you'll see the picture of a table. And this is one of the things that the community challenged us at the very beginning of this initiative. We came to them and said, look, there's a lot of issues in this neighborhood. You don't have access to the full range of clinical services. We'd like to work with you. And they said, well, you can work with us if you involve us in all aspects of the organization of this model. So we set up this community table. And the community table has met every week, 50 weeks of the year for the last now 11 years. And the table is an open table where the clinicians come, the, we might have heads of organizations come, but the community organizations that we partner with come and they put issues on the table and they say, we're really worried about this group of children. Can we deal with da da da? We're worried about in this school, the teachers won't work with the with the parents in a way that's very effective. Can you help us move that conversation forward? So the table is, they, when um, the presenters were presenting in the earlier session, they talked about the importance of governance. This is our kind of, you must be accountable to us challenge that the community issued to us. The community also said when we partner, we partner with organizations that are, have mechanisms of accountability. So communities, organizations that have a community board, that are part of the neighborhood, that are committed to, sh who share our goals, our goals to build a healthy neighborhood and support children and families. So the whole flavor of the model is such that it's about us working collaboratively in partnership and accountable to one another. So there, there are ways to continue those conversations. I have two minutes. So, um, so that's it. So that, um, I think what, when we started, um, we were motivated first to improve the early child development so that children could be more, we could, and support children to be more successful. As the initiatives grown and become consolidated in the community, we've worked to um, incorporate other resources with other or community groups to address the issues that we keep hearing about. Right now, our youth are, um, we're engaged with a number of issues to support our youth to manage those transitions to adulthood, but also to be successful in the community and have know that they have the community on their side and um, working with them. So um, this is a statement about um, how we see um, the need to support and respect our children through all of the generations. I guess that's it. Thank you. Thank you.